Italian coast. The quartermaster had a bakery around here. That's only our Navy from offshore, the lieutenant said. You understand the shells don't whistle in German. Now the bakers have moved around the corner. When they send the bread out with a thick, dark crust, the boys at the ovens have spent the night in a trench. Shells or no shells, every day 14,000 loaves go out. Precision work, one jump away from a foxhole. Forty-five minutes is quite a while at Anzio. The dough has to set for 45 minutes while the yeast gets to work. The burners, M1937 fire units, they get shaken up around here. In disassembly, cleaning and reassembly, the main thing is to have the proper wrenches. Stilson wrenches and pliers will beat up the unit so the boys won't get any bread at all. Punching the dough helps oxidize the yeast and drives out excess gas. It says in the book that gives you a smoother loaf. On the molding table, each piece weighs in at two pounds, four ounces. A little of this is lost in the baking. In molding, you use the heel of your hand for the pressure and the palm only as a guide. After an hour and 20 minutes under 425 degrees, the loaves go onto the shelf to cool for a while. When the night shift at the bakery is over, and the sun filters through the smoke and dust over Anzio, on the waterfront, a barrage balloon crew goes to work. They've cleared a space of all sharp objects, laid out the protective ground cloth, and now tie the thimble assembly tight to prevent leaks. With the hydrogen turned on, the balloon rises and stands with the others to close out the harbor to enemy low-altitude reconnaissance, torpedo launching, and mine lane. These stand guard to seaward. But to landward, where the Germans look down upon Anzio from the southern hills, no balloon can forbid the air to the flight of shells. To the south, Near the edge of no man's land, there's a temporary lull in the barrage. The engineers are throwing a dam across the Mussolini drainage canal. The water held back by the dam can be loosed some night across the face of a Nazi counterattack. Like at other government waterworks, no trespassing signs have to be planted roundabout. But the enemy pays no attention to English, so he must be held off by more unmistakable means like stakes pounded into the ground to support barbed wire. Camouflage nets to blend bridge approaches with the terrain. TNT planted in the ground. No trespassing in German. One team digs the holes and carefully collects the spoil and burlap bags. The planter follows along with an anti-personnel mine. A second team plants the anti-tank mines. They replace the turf in the same spot and remove all signs of disturbance.
The canal is a natural tank barrier. And if any Germans should get lost and stray into the neighborhood, the barbed wire concertina will hold them until they can be set on the right road. One strand of wire can be cut, but this tangled roll will take time and skill and undisturbed good luck before the enemy can penetrate it by surprise. The sun climbs, the morning goes, and even bomb-shaken heroes will yell for chow. In town, at the bakery, the day shift is getting ready to ship the fresh loaves. They've been mixed and molded, baked and cooled. Fresh nerves, muscles and brains to hold the front. A new Christmas stocking for 1944, the GI mattress cover. You sleep on it, you dry silverware with it, and it's taken the place of the Middle West as America's breadbasket. The GI mattress cover brings home the groceries. Well, not home exactly, but the best the neighborhood offers. The mattress cover keeps the fresh bread clean, making for less handling of the loaves themselves and providing a more sanitary means of distribution. Soldier, they're ours. B-24s, of course, four engines, twin tails. Bread, dams, mines, wire, and balloons. If the beachhead is to live, a single brain must direct the sinews that tie these things together. Here, where the Germans, whenever they please, can pound every foot of earth with shells, the brain of the 6th Army Corps is deep underground. Like the skull surrounding a man's head, the solid rock walls of an old wine cellar encase the staff and command of the Sixth Corps. Here the planners and specialists have their headquarters. The special staff ordnance officer takes apart a disarmed enemy shell to search out its dimensions, devices, and materials. The ordnance officer is one of many staff specialists. Artillery, engineers, quartermaster, medical, and the several administrative services. These men provide the facts and estimates on which the plans of the general staff are based. These men assemble the stuff with which plans are executed. The office of the Corps Finance Department, paymaster and accountant for a city with no permanent location. Each nation that passes under the feet of the infantry requires a new currency. At Anzio, if there were anything to buy, the soldiers could spend these Italian invasion lira. The finance department operates a gigantic bank of issue whose place of business never stays long in one spot and whose payroll list changes from day to day. The money's counted out, but 70% of their pay on the average the soldiers send home to their families. The staff signal officer lives by his Bible, the SOP standing operating procedure, the law and the profits of military communications. Its commandments will turn a wine vault into a telephone exchange, bring a hundred thousand men within reach of one voice, and bend them to one purpose under one command. This commonplace miracle can't be sustained by faith alone. It has to be checked constantly for shorts, grounds, and breaks, especially through the complex terminal strips. Maps and aerial mosaics, our newest guidebooks for travel abroad. What to look for near historic Anzio, Italy. Today the office finds a new point of interest. Not a Roman ruin, but a road, darker and heavier than normal with enemy troop movements. A patrol will have to visit the locality. Once before that road looked black with traffic and two days later when the Germans attacked, we nearly had to swim back to Naples. Definitely, an infantry patrol must be sent to feel out the enemy and to bring in some prisoners for questioning. The patrol leader sketches in the dirt. 
On this road, it looks like the crowds are too busy, he says. In this village, we try for prisoners from an enemy OP. Now, here's our plan. Anybody got any questions? Let's go. Headquarters orders out an infantry patrol. Headquarters also warns the artillery to pack a few rods in case the enemy mob is out for trouble. The artillery digs in an eight-inch howitzer. A couple of gunners use the spoil to sandbag the revetments. Another checks on the breach and firing pin. While the revetments go up, one member of the crew chops logs to support the camouflage net. New artillery emplacements mean new communications. From a drum, DR-5, the wire will pay off quickly and easily. The DR-5 fits onto a mount built into the back of a jeep. With one man walking behind to lay the wire out of the way of the traffic, the jeep will do the heavy work and get the lines in fast. The wire runs down the side of the road, out of the way of trucks and tanks, but first it's got to be anchored. With a fence running along right next to the highway, it's simple enough to pull the end of the line off of the drum and tie it onto a fence post with a simple hitch. One man's share of victory could be to step over a wire like this so as not to cut it with his boots. Beyond the wire and the big guns, the patrol in search of Nazi prisoners sneaks across the German lines. Tourists without passports, they cross the receding borders of the Greater Reich in a wedge formation, keeping low, seeking cover, silent, with a sharp guard to front, rear, and flank. Objective: a probable enemy outpost. The BAR for a base of fire. Around the wall to move up toward a rear door. Creeping and crawling, a diamond formation closes in. Riflemen cover a grenade thrower. Now, with rifles covering every door and window, in fast while the enemy is still stunned. OP has been abandoned. On into town. Headquarters waits. The artillery is waiting. Camouflage nets not only mask the guns, but also make a weapon of surprise when the gunplay starts. The nets are garnished heavily in the middle, thinning out toward the edges, and always in colors to match the season and terrain. The signalmen, to speed their job, have tapped the commercial lines for a stretch, but now they cross over to some woods before heading toward a command post. An LC-61 plow lays the wire and buries it, giving protection and increased talking range. The wire is going in. The big guns wait. Everything hangs on getting word from the infantry patrol. They filtered into the village. No protective gullies here. No tall grass. Perhaps no Nazis. Mortifier. 
One man killed. Lesson one in hating the enemy. Back at Battery Headquarters, the line is in and tests okay. Down it goes to the observers in the OP by hand reel over fields and swamps. The artillery is ready. And to bring the guns the information they need, a tired infantry patrol walks out of Nazi land back onto the beachhead. They're bringing a few unwilling immigrants with them will doubtless be detained by the authorities. Nazi prisoners out of whose mouths needed information will leak during careful questioning. Name, rank, and serial number. Have you been long in this sector? No, not long. The prisoner unwittingly confirms the news of enemy concentrations, and the word is flashed ahead and then through to headquarters. Headquarters passes the intelligence down to the artillery. The artillery checks for itself through an OP. The crew of the observation post with a BC scope and binoculars study the sector and spot the activity at a crossroad on the edge of the hills. They must plot the position on a grid map of the sector so they can telephone precise information and grid numbers back to fire direction center. By translating geography into symbols on a map, the gunners can annihilate an enemy they never see. The military map gives the army a common language, more precise and deadly and international than German or English or Japanese. The target is pinned down in letters and numbers. It goes to the counter-battery officer who checks on the overlay to see what enemy guns are in the area. We must know this to protect our own guns from destruction. The sergeant at the plotting board finds which of our batteries are within range of the target. This is to be an artillery bingo. Every available piece of every caliber, like the barrage that stopped the first German counterattack and killed 25,000 Nazis. Bingo, the man says. Sector Fish L841. A crew of the 8-inch howitzer goes into action. joins in, and a 90 millimeter anti-aircraft, the little pack howitzers kick it around. A 75 on a Sherman tank, self-propelled 105s on a tank chassis. take this lying down. Headquarters knows that and is planning measures of protection. The daylight hours are not quite over, so an order goes out to pull a concealing blanket up over the beachhead. One hundred gallons an hour of oil and eight gallons of water are heated and pressed together into milky fog. 
The mixture is constantly checked to get the combination that best suits the velocity of the wind and the humidity of the air. The smoke, harmless to lungs and clothing, streams 10 or 12 miles in a gentle cover. The generators have been scattered to be ready regardless of the wind. Under the smoke, the barrage goes on. Above the smoke, night falls on Anthio. Through the smoke and night, the guns still speak. They tell the story of the beachhead. They're saying that the Nazis are an unpredictable thing to have in front of you. They're saying that the sea is an unfriendly thing to have at your back.